Hello and welcome to another uh, YouTube video on atomic physics. Now, today's going to be a little bit different from the other things I've done in the past. All of my previous videos have been concerned with classical physics. That means electronics, uh, kinematics, stuff that goes on in kind of the real world that you can see and you can interpret. So if I tell you that F is equal to ma, you can go out and see that if you push something harder, it accelerates at a greater rate. If you make that thing heavier, it accelerates at a lower rate. So all this kind of stuff has been verifiable and understandable. But now we're moving into atomic physics. And atomic physics is closely related to quantum mechanics. And it's related to those kind of branches of physics that we can't easily experiment with and that don't make a lot of sense without doing a heck of a lot of maths. So you're going to have to be uh, kind of trust me a bit more than you would do in the past when I just tell you things. Some of the things I'm going to tell you are gross simplifications um, that just really aren't true at a, at a fundamental level, but which work for our purposes. Um, so you might find this a little bit more frustrating than the previous ones. Um, that's why I've done this as quite a long video as well. I've, I've kind of um, explained the, the whole of this topic in one go. So that means that you, you are going to need to uh, pause this video, rewind, go over it a lot of, uh, probably a few times before it really sinks in. But by the end of today, uh, you should be able to understand the fundamental nature of particles and why that causes alpha, beta and gamma radiation. To get through your CIEA level, uh, you should really be able to interpret nuclear notation, state what the fundamental particles are, and state what happens during alpha, beta, and gamma decay. I would really like it if, in addition to that, you could explain why uh, neutrinos are formed during decays, and if you could use Feynman diagrams to illustrate nuclear decays in terms of fundamental particles. So, this is probably some nuclear notation that you're fairly familiar with, at least from your chemistry. Um, so you've got a 3 here and a 7 up here. So in the past, you might have called uh, the 3 the atomic number, and you probably would have called the 7 the atomic mass. Well, for physics, those terms are brilliant. They're not hugely descriptive of what we actually want to be getting on here. So we tend to call this number 3 down here the proton number. Because as you know, that's number of protons. And we call the 7 the nucleon number. Now a nucleon is any proton or neutron or in fact anything else that exists in the nucleus. Um, so in this case, um, that's saying that 7 is the total protons and neutrons. And fairly obviously, if I have 3 as the protons, that means I'm going to have 4 neutrons in this atom. Uh, obviously the Li, that is the element, so this is a lithium atom, uh, and you might also sometimes be asked how many electrons there are, so because there are three protons, we will have three electrons in a neutral atom. Those of you doing chemistry will know that you very rarely get an atom existing just purely by itself. Lithium, for example, usually uh, forms a uh, sort of metallic solid. But for our purposes, um, we usually have how many electrons there are in a neutral atom. Okay, but let's think about um, how that nucleus was discovered. Um, you probably know that the uh, basic idea of what's in the nucleus, if we take, go back to our uh, lithium atom, we would be expecting to see something like this. In the centre we would have one, two, three protons, and we would have one, two, three, four neutrons, and then orbiting around on the outside, we're going to have one, two, three electrons, and um, obviously I know, I know chemists will be in different shells, but with physicists we don't need to care about that. 
But how do we actually come up with that? Because as you know, the atom is super small, I mean, ridiculously small, far too small for us to ever observe directly. So how do we come up with this? Well, the short answer is at first we didn't. Um, the prevailing idea of what an atom was after the atom was kind of understood to be a thing um, was this model that you see here. This is called the plum pudding model. And it existed for a relatively long time. Um, now, by this point, chemists had discovered that electrons were a thing and that electrons were involved in bonding. So they knew that electrons could travel from one atom to another, and they knew that those atoms were, were sorry, those, uh, those electrons uh, could be shared. So basically, they discovered covalent and ionic bonding. But they couldn't really work out how it was related to the nucleus, so they kind of came up with this idea, or they didn't come up with the idea of the nucleus at all. They had the idea that they must have been something positive, because that was what would have attracted the electrons. So they said, that, okay, well, let's say the atom is a big ball. It's a big ball of positive charge. And then stuck into that ball at various intervals will be our electrons. So you've kind of got this amorphous blob of positive charge, and then these little electrons stuck into it. And that sort of worked for a lot of their models, because they said, well, these electrons can leave and travel off and join another atom, uh, but it's still, they're still attractive, so it still feel a force pulling them back towards the nucleus, and it sort of worked for a lot of what they were doing. Um, but there came a time when uh, we discovered Rutherford's experiment. So Rutherford, as you know, fired a stream of alpha particles at some thin gold foil. Now, why did he do that? Basically, he was trying to say, well, is this model true? If the model is true, then you're going to have your alpha particle here. Now, remember, alpha particles have a charge of a plus two, so they're going to be positively charged. And he'd expect them to head towards the atom at very high speed. But what he calculated was, because they had a rough idea of the size of the atom, they could work out how much it would repel stuff, and he said, well, the atom, the, the charge is so spread out that it should barely deflect these alpha particles. They should go straight through if this model is true. Um, so it wasn't even that exciting an experiment. He, was, he wasn't hoping to disprove anything. He was just saying, well, let's just get some additional evidence to say if what we believe is true is true. But what we discovered was something totally different. So this is the expected results. He kind of thought that the alpha particles would go through, and they just travel straight through each other's side. But bizarrely, well not loads, but a small fraction bounced back. Now all the equations that he'd done, all the calculations that he'd worked out of how much an alpha particle would be repelled by a nucleus said that that cannot happen. And he likened it to, well, if I had a sheet of tissue paper spread across the room and I fired a cannonball at it, it's like the cannonball's bouncing back at us. There was no explanation in their model for why the heck that would happen. It didn't make sense. Unless the nucleus was way more charged than they expected. Now, the nucleus couldn't be way more charged than they expected because they knew that the nuclear charge had to balance out the electron charge. And they kind of knew the charge of an electron. So, it started to get really confusing until they had the idea, well, what about if the nucleus is tiny? If the nucleus is really, really tiny, then we have a very small, very, very positive charge concentrated at the center of an atom. And if that happens, then the charge will be big enough to repel an electron. So an electron comes whizzing in like this, and it gets so close to such a huge amount of charge that it bounces off in a different direction. And that was totally revolutionary. And that's what discovered that this thing here in the center was full of positive charge. Now it's important to note this did not say that we this did not give us this model of protons and neutrons because we didn't have neutrons yet. They had no idea that neutrons existed. That came much later when they started to reconcile well, why are some elements heavier than others and why do we have ions? So we've talked a lot about protons, neutrons, and electrons. So let's think about the particles that actually that there actually are. Um, what you probably remember from when you were in uh, Key Stage Three, I think, in GCSE, is that there are three basic particles. You've got your proton, which has a charge of two. What? No, it doesn't. A charge of plus one um, and a mass of plus one. You have your uh, neutrons, 
which have a charge of zero and a mass of plus one. And you have your electrons, which have a charge of negative one and a mass of either zero or one over two thousand or one over eighteen thousand and Lots. And yes, there's been in every class, probably since year seven, some kid at the back going, uh, but what about quarks? I've heard that quarks exist, and do you know what? If you were that kid, it's finally your time to shine, because you're absolutely right. So we've been lying to you all this time. Matter is not made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. In about 30 seconds' time, you're going to see why we've lied to you all this time. It's not because we want to keep away the secret forbidden knowledge. It's because it's really, really hard. Um, so this diagram here shows you the actual particles that exist. And these are fundamental particles. So there's very good reason to believe that these particles cannot be broken down any further. So let's go into what these are. We have the quarks. Quarks... Um, are the building blocks of protons and neutrons. Um, I'm going to write that in there. Building blocks of protons and neutrons. But they can also do so much more. They can do, uh, they can make these particles called mesons that you'll find out about. They can do all sorts of other weird stuff. We also have leptons. Leptons are super light, um, and they tend to, oh, sorry, one more thing, quarks. Quarks, um, they can't usually exist by themselves. Um, if you get a quark in isolation, um, it will do weird things to create another quark to be friends with. It hates being alone um, for weird quantum mechanical reasons. Leptons, they're super light, they're okay, they go solo, so they can exist alone. Uh, then we have gauge particles, uh, sometimes called force carriers. Uh, these have some weird properties. Um, so, for instance, you can have as many of them as you like in one place. Um, quarks and leptons often not all the time, but you usually can't get two quarks to occupy the same space, but you can with gauge particles. Um, and they're actually responsible for forces. So the gauge particles are responsible for forces. Um, so the one that you're most familiar with is the photon. Now up till now we've known the photon is something that carries light, but it does so much more. Take your hands, push them together. Now you should know by now that the reason your hands are pushing against each other is because the electrons in this hand are repelling the electrons in this hand. So it's not something, some idea of matter actually touching matter, it's the idea of electrons repelling other electrons. But, how is that happening? Well, it turns out that if I have an electron over here, and an electron over here, it's actually sending photons from one electron to the other. And that photon is saying, hey, repel. Um, it's kind of carrying a message in that photon to tell it to do stuff. Now, there's loads of other models that we can use to explain how that happens, but you can just think of it as the messenger part. It's like a messenger. It goes across and says, oh, you need to be doing some repelling. Um, we also have this particle here called the gluon that, that carries the strong force. I'm going to explain about that in a little while. Same with the weak force. So the weak force are carried by the W and Z bosons. And we'll talk about what the weak force is in a minute. There are also some scalar particles. Now, the scalar particles, um, they seem to transmit information about what matter really is. So the Higgs boson, as I'm sure you've heard about from CERN, the Higgs boson transmits information about how much mass there is in something. So it's kind of responsible for why when you push something, it takes more force. Um, that's going into super weird physics, so I don't have a clue how it works, so I'm not going to talk any more about the Higgs. Um, there is another gauge particle that's thought to exist called the graviton, but we've never been able to really isolate it, and again, it behaves really weirdly. So sometimes you'll see these diagrams include the graviton, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's also worth noting that for CIE, um, when it comes to the matter particles, we're only going to concern ourselves with these ones, the first generation one. 
Uh, so that's the up and down quark, the electron neutrino, and the electron. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more about that later. So let's think about what's actually inside a nucleus. We've said before that you can only get quarks. So when we said before that it's got protons and neutrons, that was a lie. Protons are made up of other stuff, neutrons are made up of other stuff. So what are they actually made up of? Well, I can never remember which way around it is, but I'm going to work it out as we go. Um, protons and neutrons are only made up of the up quark and the down quark. Now the up quark and down quark are the lightest of the particles and they're the most prevalent. The universe is 99.999 of the mass of the universe. Nearly all the masses should be made up of up and down quarks. These charm, strange, top and bottom ones are weird um, and mostly only occur in exotic nuclear reactions. We don't really need to worry about them for CIE. So, what goes on here? Well, all new, uh, no, all protons and neutrons are types of particles called hadrons. Now, if you think about the CERN's Large Hadron Collider, that might start to mean something to you. The Large Hadron Collider smashes together protons. Protons are hadrons. That's why the LHC is called the Large Hadron Collider. So, what are hadrons? Hadrons are any particle made of three quarks or three anti-quarks. And we'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. So, if I know that protons and neutrons are made up of three quarks, and it can only be an up or down quark, we should be able to work this out relatively simply, I hope. Um, ooh, what about? So, let's take the proton first. I need three quarks to exist together. Now, we know that the charge on the quarks are here. So an up quark has a charge of plus two thirds, a down quark has a charge of negative a third. So it kind of makes sense that a proton then should be an up, an up, and a down. Because if it's an up, up, down, then we get plus two thirds, plus two thirds, minus a third, which, if you add that all together, that comes to plus one. So we can represent a quark, so we can represent a proton as up, up, down. So we can write up, up, down, U, U, D, that's the symbol, we're using these symbols for it. So we can say a proton is an up, an up, an up quark, an up quark, and a down quark. What about the neutron? Well, again, I know I'm going to need three quarks. I'm going to need it to have a charge of zero because it's neutral. So an up, sorry, sorry, so a neutron will be one up and two down. So I'll get an up, a down, and a down. That'll be plus two thirds, take away a third, take away a third, so that will come to zero total charge. So I can write down a neutron as uh, up, down, down. And there we go. I've explained now how these particles are actually made. Inside those nucleuses, we've got gluons constantly sending information between them, telling them to hold themselves together. So that, of course, leads us to a bit of a problem. Inside the nucleus, I've got protons. Now, these protons are very strongly repelling each other. Why? Because they've got a charge of plus one. And you've brought something with a charge of plus one really close to something else with a charge of plus one. So a big problem for physicists for ages was why doesn't the nucleus just fly apart? It shouldn't stick together. We didn't know of anything that would stick the nucleus together. So that's where the strong force came in. So based on all of our understanding so far, there should be a big force. And I'm going to say red is equal to the electromagnetic force. Now, 
That comes from the fact that we've got a charge of plus one, charge of plus one. Those two plus one charges are going to repel each other. So why doesn't the nucleus just fly apart instantly? So what was theorized was, okay, there must be something else that's causing a really strong force that way. And they knew it must be one hell of a force. So they called it, so they called it the strong force. Because it must be incredibly strong in order to, re to, to stop those um, atoms from repelling. Now if we think about force and distances, uh, we can start to infer a few things about the strong force and this new electro sorry, electromagnetic force. So we know that as distance gets smaller, the electromagnetic force becomes infinite because the distance is to zero. And as you get further and further away, the electromagnetic force gets weaker between the two. So how are we going to get a force that overcomes this? Well, the strong force, then, must be really attractive. I'm going to extend this graph down here. The strong force must be really attractive at a certain distance. Um, so it's going to be somewhere down here. And actually, at very far distances, it's, it's repulsive, but I don't want to get into that too much right now. Um, so the strong force kind of does something like this. What does that mean? It means that at big distances, so when I'm somewhere over here, oops, when I'm somewhere over here, so at a big distance, then the electromagnetic force wins. So the repulsion wins. And you can see the height here is bigger than the height here. So the dominant force is the repulsive electrostatic force. But at short distances, short distances, I'm writing like a maniac, but at short distances, the strong force wins, or is larger, if you can read that. Thing. So that means that when you get very, very close together, suddenly the strong force takes over and it holds together that whole nucleus. Um, we do find that the strong force must be repulsive at very short distances. Um, and that's basically because if it wasn't, then the ma all matter would collapse into a tiny little lump because the strong force would just pull everything together into one big lump. Um, it doesn't do that, so the strong force has this weird property of a really short distance, it's repulsive. So what you end up with is atoms exist here, or atoms sit here. So, the new, so a, a proton is pulled towards another proton until the strong force starts to go uh, repulsive again, and then it sort of sits there hovering at this point constantly kind of going a little bit up down here, a little bit down like that, and just sits there. If the nucleus tries to pull, up, pull up itself apart more, then the strong force will become attractive and pull it back together. If it tries to collapse in itself, then the strong force becomes repulsive and pushes it back. So this is the distance that nuclear the atoms sit. If you're doing AQA physics, um, you'll need to know that's a couple of femtometers for uh, CIE. You don't. Now, all this is very well and good, but it doesn't completely explain to us about something else. Why is it that we have neutrons? Why do they exist? Well, they actually fill up quite an interesting purpose. If you go away and calculate the effect of the strong force and the effect of the electrostatic repulsion, what you find is that as you add more and more and more protons in there, you're going to need progressively more and more strong force to hold them together. So the cool thing that neutrons do is the neutrons, they also have the strong force. So the neutrons experience a strong force too towards their nearby protons and pull everything together. And the protons also experience it. So as you add in more and more protons, what we have to do is also add more neutrons. Because the neutrons, they experience the strong force, but not electrostatic. 
the protons experience strong and electrostatic. So what we find is, um, like I say, as we add more and more protons, we, we start adding neutrons because they won't repel them. They won't be repelled by electrostatic force, but they will give you extra pull to keep the nucleus together. And that leads us on to radioactive decay. So let's look at the effect that all this has in the real world. Um, you've probably seen this graph before. This is the NZ curve where we have the number of protons, which we call Z down here, and the number of neutrons on the other axis. And what we find is that all elements exist along this kind of curve. Um, it's not exactly N is equal to Z. We need, with lots more protons, we need increasingly more neutrons. And this can be explained by thinking back and thinking about the strong force. If I add in more and more and more protons, they're going to repel each other more, so I need more neutrons to give me additional strong force to hold it together. So what happens if I have a particle that exists here? What will it do? Well, if it's over here, it has too many neutrons for the number of protons that it has. Its number of neutrons should be way down here. So, what can it do? The only thing it can do is turn a neutron into a proton. And that makes it a beta plus emitter. Uh, sorry, a beta minus emitter. Um, if I have a particle that exists over here, well, what does that one do? It's got too many protons, not enough neutrons, so it wants to go that way. So it's going to turn a proton into a neutron. And that gives me beta plus. Now you should remember that beta minus involves, um, as I said before, a neutron into a proton and it produces an electron. What should be new to most people is this idea of beta minus. Beta minus is a proton turning into a neutron and emitting a positron or a positive electron. So I want to a quick note about that. Um, antiparticle so in antiparticles, um, we have a, well, for every particle, we have an antiparticle. Um, and with a, an antiparticle, um, the mass is always the same, but the charge is always opposite. So I could write it like that. So if I have a charge of zero in my particle, my antiparticle will also have a charge of zero. But if I have a charge of minus one on my particle, my antiparticle will have a charge of plus one. And I can always denote antiparticles by making them wear a little hat. Um, so you'll often see, for example, um, an electron is the particle, an electron with a hat on is the antiparticle. Okay, so as you know, there are three different types of decay. We have alpha, beta, sorry, four different types of decay. Beta plus, beta minus, and we have gamma. So in alpha decay, we have the element X, which has a number A and Z, and that becomes an alpha particle with two, four as its number. Sorry, got those the wrong way around. Um, Or two uh, plus new element y and its a number will be take away four, its z number will be take away two. Beta plus has a z element x and that turns into a beta plus particle or a positron. Now we can call the positron of having a mass number of zero because the mass number hasn't changed. Um, but we can give it a plus one as its proton number because it's gained an extra proton. And we can call that a beta plus, and we're going to put a hat on it to show that it's evil, it's an antiparticle. So that becomes alongside an A, because A hasn't changed, protons just, hang on, let me go back to the notes, uh, beta plus, yeah, a proton has turned into a neutron, so Z will be minus one. Why? And for beta minus, we will have A, Z, X, 
that will turn into 0, negative 1, beta minus, no hat because it's uh, turned into a real thing, plus a z plus 1 y. Now, we've conserved a lot of things here. In these two reactions, um, you can see that the total charge has stayed the same because here I've gone from a, uh, I've, I've created some negative, I've lost some positive charge um, because doing the minus one here, that means some positive charge has exited the universe, but I've regained it here. Now, if we go all the way back to the particle zoo that we talked about ages ago, just here, you'll see that we have these leptons. So we have the electron and the electron neutrino. Now why is that important? That's important because it turns out that the total number of leptons in the universe must stay the same. So I'm going to write this little rule here. Total leptons must stay the same. And it's just a weird rule of the universe. So what does that mean? Well, in beta plus decay, I am creating an anti-lepton. So I've got a lept I've got minus one leptons in the universe. So I'm also going to have to create a lepton, and I'm going to call it that. This is a neutrino, and it's actually an electron. And I've done that, like I say, down here in yellow, to keep the number of leptons in the universe as the same. This has a lepton number of negative 1, because it's an anti-lepton. This has a lepton number of plus 1. In this case, I would be to minus, so this is a real lepton, a non-antiparticle, a non so it has a lepton number of plus 1. So I'm going to need to also create an anti-electron neutrino. And that's, again, to balance out the total number of leptons in the universe. Um, one last type of decay is gamma decay. Poor old gamma gets ignored a lot um, because it doesn't really do anything. Um, you just get zero, zero gamma. And that's an energy that's been left over. Sometimes the nucleus is energized, so it has to leave. OK, so all this can get quite confusing. So I'm going to teach you one last little trick, and that's a Feynman diagram. This isn't needed for CIE. If you're doing AQA, it is needed, though. Um, but it's quite cool. So, on a Feynman diagram, we have two axes, a time axis and a space axis. Um, and we're just basically going to show how particles change over time. So, if I have a football just sat there on the ground, then it's not travelling through space. So, as the time axis goes on, the space axis will stay at the same value. So, it's be a horizontal line. If I kick a ball, though, I'll get something that looks like this. As time increases, my displacement or my position in space increases. It's really important to realise that I'm using space as one dimensional, so it looks a bit weird. Let's think about this though. Let's think about a ball hitting someone in the face and bouncing off. So in the space axis, as time goes on, it will move towards the face, like that, until it hits the face, and then it will bounce off like that. And again, it's really important to remember time is going up this axis, space is going up on this axis. Um, and one last thing to think about, um, if I have a fast ball versus a slow ball. So a slow ball, as time goes on, it won't travel through much space. But a fast ball, as time goes by, it'll travel through a lot of space. So basically, um, the steeper the line on a Feynman diagram, the slower it's going. The um, shallower the line, the faster it's going. Now, in Feynman diagrams, I can use basically three things. I can use a straight line for a particle, and I can use a wavy line for a gauge particle. Remember, right from the start, we said that a gauge particle um, carries a force. Um, now, we haven't, we've talked about the strong force here, so let's say I've got two uh, protons that are trying to escape. So there's a proton, there's another proton. Now what will happen is, a gauge particle, in this case a gluon, will pass between them, and they'll carry on their merry way, but they'll be more attracted to each other. So that's a simplified diagram. 
What I haven't talked about so far is the weak particle. And this is where it's going to get a bit more interesting. Let's just do one more example to make sure we're really clear. So electrons often repel electrons. So here's my electron coming towards another electron. Now, I said before that it's actually photons that transmit the electromagnetic force. So what we can show is one photon, which is like a symbol gamma, travelling from one electron to the other. And then because they've repelled each other, the electrons will move apart. B to the K, in a final diagram, then, does something quite cool. Uh, there are two different ways we can do it. I'm going to do the simple way first. So this is B to minus decay. So in beta minus, again, I'm going to have to look it up because I can never remember this. Uh, beta minus, we have a neutron turning into a proton. So I'm going to start off with my neutron. And I know it's going to become a proton. But what actually happens in the, in the inter interim time? Well, what happens is that neutron emits a boson. And it's a W boson. Now if we go back to here, we said that we've got this force called the weak force that's carried by the W boson. So the weak force, that's responsible for radioactive decay. So the neutron emits this W boson, and then that W boson will decay into two things. One thing will be my beta minus particle, and the other thing will be my electron anti-neutrino. Um, now, this the charge over here is negative one, so this W boson must have a negative charge. This isn't actually needed for CIE, but it's really interesting to show how it works. So a neutron becomes a proton, it emits this W minus, and it becomes an electron neutrino. Now, we know that a neutron is made up of a down-down-up, and a proton is made up of an up-up-down uh, quarks. So I could also show this interaction at a more subatomic level. What I can show is that obviously uh, one of the downs will be unaffected, so I'll have a down to a down. One of my ups will be affected, but I will also have a down turning into an up. So when that down turns into an up, that's what emits the W minus, which then becomes the beta minus and the anti-electron. So I can show it that way as well, and sometimes in the notes you'll see it that way. Beta plus is very similar, so beta minus was a neutron into a proton, beta plus therefore will be a proton into a neutron. So this time I'll get a W plus because I'm losing my positive charge. Yeah, I have a plus here, zero here, so that, must, that W boson must carry the positive charge. And that again will become a beta plus particle and an electron neutrino. This time it's not an antiparticle because this was the antiparticle before. If I did it in terms of uh, the quarks, a uh, proton is an up, up, down, neutron is a down, down, up. So I would have my up is unaffected, up, up. One of my downs is unaffected, so down, down. One of my other ups becomes a down, emits the W plus boson, and becomes a beta plus and an electron neutrino. So, all of this together tells us a little bit more about how nuclear decays happen. So any particle interacting, anytime one particle interacts with another, it must conserve charge. If you go back to these uh, Feynman diagrams, you can see I start here with positive charge, neutral charge up here, um, but, ah, I keep this in the wrong button, so I start with plus one, I've got zero here, but I have a plus one there, that's zero, so total charge has been conserved. Same thing in beta minus, uh, here I have zero, plus one, negative one, zero, so charge is always conserved during these decays. 
They must also conserve lepton number. If I create an electron, I must create an anti-electron neutrino as well to conserve lepton number. If an electron is destroyed, uh, that means I would have to create an electron neutrino to balance out the number of leptons in the universe. Strange doesn't want to get into very much, but some particles have this property called strangeness that means they must make other strange particles. For CIE, you don't need it. If you're doing AQA, um, look it up online. Um, and mass energy. We'll get into a lot more about mass energy in the year 13. You've come through an awful lot of particle physics here. I do not expect you to understand it all, especially the stuff about Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams are really there as a toy to show us some cool stuff and to make these diagrams a little bit simpler to understand. In the lesson, you're going to get lots of practice of drawing them along with other radioactive decays. Like I say, this is office tough. So if you do have questions, please come and see me or ask me in the lesson. Um, but I hope this has kind of whetted your appetite for some real physics. This is the experimental stuff that is weird and cool and cutting edge and hard. So I hope you um, feel that if you go back and watch this again and kind of look over it, you'll, uh, you'll follow it along. Um, but for now, thank you very much for watching. I think you've earned a cup of tea.